Oh, let's uh, turn our attention to uh, Celtic versus Rangers at the weekend in the Scottish League Cup. I'm delighted to say Tom English is with us. Uh, Tom, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. I'm, I'm very well. Uh, before we get into the, the football, maybe we'll just talk a little bit about the rugby and mm. this rising anxiety that we suddenly have in Ireland about um, uh, we were just pencilling in a World Cup <laughs> quarter final automatically, but now all of a sudden Scotland are good again. What are you getting there anxious about though? Well, I mean, Ireland, Ireland are invincible. Uh, <laughs> see, that's the thing. History teaches us that <laughs> that's not actually true. But, but listen, never mind history. This is this team cliche creating new history. Now relax, Ger. All is all is fine. All is fine. Um, I think Scotland will put it up to Ireland, definitely. But Ireland are much further down the road as a team than, than Scotland are. Although Scot, you know, Scotland have. Scotland have made made big strides in the Six Nations, even on even on Sunday when they lost from ninety and nil down. They made a they made a hell of a game of it. Scored three tries, could have scored another three. Lost a line out um, on French five meter line early on in the game. Xander Fagus and dropped the ball going over the line. Jamie Ritchie threw a lousy pass to Duane Van der Merwe out in the right wing. If he threw it a little bit ahead of him. He'd have scored. Nobody stops doing Van der Merwe from that range. So a lot of what might have been. But I think Ireland, listen, Ireland and some heavy hitters coming back for Ireland as well by the looks of it. So uh, it's Grand Slam Ahoy, boys. Don't worry about it. Well, uh, it's also the World Cup that I'm concerned about where... <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, awfully, you're, very, you're, very, you're a very concerned man. Jerry. Well, we, really Chill out. Four years ago, uh, we, we were terrible and Scotland completely did not show up in that game. Yes, um, yeah. And that's kind of the level of flakiness that we're used to when it comes to, with the, the odd exception, when the bus was late that time, obviously, uh, Scotland scored two early <laughs> tries and, and Joe Schmidt's <laughs> year was ruined. Um, and then there was the game in, uh, in Croke Park. But other than that, we've basically handled our business. And now we have to yeah. take them seriously. Um, y- yeah, and I think Andy Farrell will definitely take the Scotland team seriously. Because, you know, they're scoring a lot of tries. And I think Scotland will score tries against Ireland, as good as Ireland's defence is. I think our, uh, Scotland will score tries. But um, Ireland are so relentless now and so powerful. And I think power will probably win the day um, in Edinburgh. But, you know, the place will be heaving. Um, <coughs> massive crowd. You, you, never, you never know, but I think Ireland are just too professional and got too many weapons to lose. But... They'd want to be on their metal on the day. That's all I'll say. They'd want to be very good on the day to win. What's the mood music, Tom, around the, the Scottish fans and players and, and, and management? Like, is it a is it a massive air of positivity? As someone was saying this morning, they haven't won a triple crown since since nineteen ninety. So they've clearly come on leaps and bounds. Yeah, they, they have. I would say a cautious optimism. You know, when you've been beaten down as as much as these Scotland supporters have um, over twenty plus years, you know, there's nothing. Well, if you include Edinburgh and Glasgow, they've won one trophy since 1999. Um, that's a whole lot of disappointment, right? And disappointment is kind of is kind of bred into the Scotland rugby fans. So they're not nobody's getting carried away. They're enjoying what they're seeing. They're enjoying a very ambitious rugby team playing excellent rugby. You know, in a world of where it's all about physicality and intensity and attrition and all this kind of buzzwords, Scotland play a, a a fantastic style of rugby. Um, spearheaded, obviously, by Finn Russell, but they've added Sione Tuipalotu to the midfield, who's made a big, big difference. Uh, Hugh Jones has come back into it after after quite a few years out, off the scene. Excellent, playing excellently. You know, they, they, are, they are a good team, Scotland. I think the Scotland rugby fans are just are enjoying, certainly enjoying winning the first two games in the championship since 1996. And probably enjoyed, actually, what they found from early on in Paris after being 19 nil down. And you could have said, you look at, I watched the game again yesterday, they actually probably should have won the game. And you look at the chances that they had, they made a couple of bad handling errors at the wrong time and France were just too good and exploited them. Tenzin's supposed to be leaving at the end of the World Cup. Is that a done deal, do you think? No, no, it's not, no. Um, my, I, I had assumed that he, was going to, he would leave, that he would have had enough. Um, I'm hearing now that he'd probably prefer to stay. Right. But but there's a bit of shadow boxing going on. I think the SRU 
you know, for fear that he might get a might get a, a, a juicy offer elsewhere, are looking around to see if there's an option for them in case he does walk. Um, but I think at the end of this Six Nations, if Townsend wants to stay, I think they'll probably renew his contract. It seems to make sense in a way as well that like there's been a steady period of building, getting depth. A lot of injuries have cleared up. He's made peace with his best player. And it, yeah. it feels like there's just a maturity about the team and the setup now. Yeah, there does, yeah. Um, now, that, you know, they'll need to keep this going until the end of the Six Nations. They'll need to play well against Ireland and obviously put Italy away in the last game. I think if that happens, then that will be a clear, so that'll be a full championship of decent performances, decent results. Um, and I think that would be enough. I think it would be. I think it would be bonkers to be honest. If Townsend wants to stay, and as you say, for those reasons, Joe, he has he has improved the squad. His relationship with Finn Russell have never been better. I think it would be kind of dynamiting your own progress if he was if they were to to get rid of him now. I, I, I just don't think it would make any sense at all. Let's move on and talk about Celtic and Rangers, which. Um, mm. uh, at the weekend there was a little bit of needle to it I, I saw the pre-match press conference where they put the two managers side by side they didn't really like that and um, <laughs> is, is the beef real between these two or is it, is it a bit manufactured no. it's, it's totally manufactured is it there's, there's, no, there's no beef between these two managers there's none at all um, there's a little bit of, it's beef obviously, obviously between the supporters or elements of the support Um but there's nothing between the managers. The fans would look at, and, and Rangers players, normally kind of ones who are just in the country five minutes, uh, very often over the years have come out with daft things before Old Firm matches, as in Rangers going, Fashion Sakala, the young Rangers winger last week going, oh, we're the best team in Scotland. Well, like, they're not. Everyone knows they're not, and they know it for sure now on, since Sunday. So I think Celtic people get amused on one level but a little bit riled on the other when Rangers repeatedly come out these Rangers players repeatedly come out and say oh we're the best team when Celtic have won 10 of the last 11 championships I mean it's a bit nuts The evolution of Celtic under Ange obviously it gets a yardstick every year in European competition and uh, in the immediate aftermath of that there's a, a kind of existential crisis about whether or not Celtic need to completely transform their style and be really boring and clog up the defence and try and score on the break, or if they're going to just continue to embrace the philosophy of Ange, which is all singing, all dancing, a beautiful thing. And um, I can I can see <laughs> I can see why if you're like a Celtic diehard, you're like, well, oh, it'd be great if we could just win some games in Europe. Yeah, um, and Postecoglou is not going to change for anybody. Um, this is the way he plays. You look at the players he signs. Uh, he signs players to fit his kind of philosophy. I know it's a horrible word, but anyway. Um, he wants high tempo. He wants uh, energetic players. <clears throat> the one kind of concession he's made, kind of half concession he's made, is Aaron Moy, the Australian international. Um, but Moy can play. I mean, Moy was excellent against against Rangers. So uh, I think... Postecoglou, even like he would point to Europe, uh, the Champions League, and they, they drew twice against Shakhtar. They lost both their games against Real Madrid and RB Leipzig. But all of those games, they played well in, in chunks of them. They created loads of chances. I mean, the 3 0 at home, the first game in the Champions League against Real Madrid, they were the better side for close to an hour. And then Madrid said, right, OK, let's start playing here. And they won 3 0. But a lot of a lot of stuff was really good stuff, and Pasta Cogli will say, "All right, if we keep doing this, we'll learn the lessons we learned from this Champions League. We'll bring them into next Champions League, and we'll get better." But you're right; it's the acid test because you know what you look for. You look for results against expectation, and there will be no result against expectation domestically for Celtic because they're that much better than everyone else. Like they're miles better than ten of the teams in the league, and they're substantially better than Rangers. So. There's nothing they can do in Scotland that would make you think, wow, that was that was a surprise. It's only when we get to Europe. You'd almost like to fast forward into into the Champions League because they will win this league and they will go straight into the Champions League. You'd like to see, okay, have they improved against the big boys with the big budgets? Does 
Does Ange Postecoglou medium to long term future lie with with Celtic Tom? Because we see when the, when these jobs come up at the Premier League, I think he's been linked with, you know, you, you <laughs> look at here, Leeds, yeah. Everton, <laughs> Wolves, Southampton, Brighton. He's been linked with them all over the last year. So has he has he commented on his future in recent weeks? Is there any uh, mood as to how that's going to play out? He, he commented it after the commented on it after the uh, the League Cup final on on, on Sunday, Shane, and he said. Um, he said, people will be surprised how long I'll be here. <laughs> now, I think he meant that he'll be here longer, but I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I going to say. <laughs> at, least which... I think, at least I think that's what he meant. Um, because, listen, he loves what he's doing. He's a very focused, tough cookie, sharp. Um, and all of the, the noise around him doesn't seem to affect him. Um, he will take a question. You know, if you say to him, oh, you've been linked with Leeds. He won't bite your head off for asking it, he'll, but he'll deal with it. He's got a very, really good verbal dexterity in all of these questions. But he loves what he's doing. He's hugely grateful for Celtic to Celtic for taking a, a chance on him. You know, he would have been trying to get into football in this part of the world for a, for, for a while. And maybe he would have been considered for jobs he didn't get them. Celtic was the one that gave him the opportunity and he's very, very loyal to them for that at some stage he'll move on if he keeps going the way he is especially if he makes some strides in Europe he will move on but he doesn't strike me as a man who's in a hurry to leave absolutely not we can't talk Sunday without talking one of Ange, Ange Postacoglu's signings Kyogo Farahashi I mean was it 4.6 yeah. million pounds and, and let's I mean, say it's been money very well spent that was at 26 goals now for the season he's a, a revelation Tom yeah he's, he's been excellent for them he's been one of the best uh, signings in Scottish football in the last 20 years he'd be, he'd, be, he'd be well up there um, and you know and include Virgil van Dijk and all this now he's not going to go on and have the career that Virgil van Dijk had but certainly impact impact in Scottish football he's been he's been huge that's uh, uh, two League Cup finals in a row where he scored the two the, the decisive goals um, he's very very dangerous player and in Scottish football he's, he's probably he's probably too good for Scottish football if you know what I mean but um, Celtic fans are loving watching him. He's he's not just he's a fine player. He look he looks like an incredible character as well. You know, so bubbly, energetic. He's 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 a fantastic Postacoglu type player. Um, and the fans the fans adore him because you know he keeps scoring goals, scoring goals of different types. Uh, he's a penalty box finisher, but he's also can he can curl one in from twenty five yards as well. Yeah, they're they're loving him, and it's it's not just him as well. You know, they had four, they they had three Japanese players in the starting lineup. Another one came off the bench. Another one was an unused sub. They had five Japanese lads in their in their match day squad, and you know they're all made. Certainly, the three that started made big contributions. Rio Hatate has has been excellent as well. So, you know, Celtic fans are really enjoying what they're seeing from from Postecoglou's team. Uh, is Michael Beale? the real deal he seems like he was the brains of the operation whenever he was associated with um, Stephen Jarrod and he's getting his own opportunity a, a real proper you know expectation level uh, is he the real deal uh, we don't know Jerry. I mean you know I think I'm, I'm always kind of dubious about this he was the brains behind the operation I swear Gerard like was sitting at home watching Netflix all day and had nothing to do with Rangers winning the league Beal is sharp. I, mean, I don't think. Uh, I, I mean, he, he, he was very inf- and he was influential under under Gerard, no question. He made a, he's made a very good start to his Rangers time. Um, before Sunday, had won thirteen, drew one. The draw was at, at Ibrox against Celtic, and they were leading it until the, leading that match until the last few minutes. I think he's he's reshaping his squad, reshaping his team. They're kind of stuck between the old team and the new team. He signed two players. Um, uh, Raskin and Cantwell. Uh, everyone thought they would start on Sunday. They didn't. So you look at what Postacoglu did. He completely ripped up the team that he inherited, signed a brand new team. Um, Beal needs to do a little bit of that. But, he's, but the summer will be interesting for him. Um, I, I always look at Beal and I think of the fact that in October, wasn't it? He's, he's turning down Wolves and saying, no, oh, you're committing to, to QPR. Like, I'm sure there's a lot of people. Like, Queen's Park Rangers were thinking 
Well, I mean, he, he wasn't a man of his word when he, a month later, turns down Rangers, but maybe he was waiting on an approach from Rangers. Yeah, that, when you know, when he joined Rangers, an, an awful lot was played out and, and all these quotes about, you know, undying loyalty to QPR uh, were, all, were, all throw, were all thrown at him. Given Didn't last long, yeah. Yeah, I think it was, was it 36 days or something later after that he, he left to go to Rangers. Um, so, yeah, like, you know, Beal, I mean, the fans, the fans, the fans have an interesting relationship with Beal. Um, they like him. He says all the right things. I mean, you swear he'd never set foot out of, out of government in his life um, because he's a Rangers man and loves this club and blah, 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 blah. He has to say all these things. He's, he's clever. And he says all the right things. Um, but the proof of the pudding and all of that. And I don't think Rangers fans will, will condemn him for losing on Sunday, although a lot of them think he picked the wrong team. Um, and his team weren't great at all on Sunday. I think next season will will be when he's judged. They'll take comfort in the fact that since he took over, they've gone in the fourteen league games. They've gone toe to toe with Celtic. Haven't scored as many goals as Celtic, but they've had the same number of points. So they will take comfort from that. But they will know post Sunday that there's still a gulf between these teams, and Rangers need new blood, and they need it for next season. Um, the role of honour uh, Rangers have won 55 Celtic have won 52 if, if Celtic win as you expect this year it'll be 53 is this something that comes up in conversation the the nine in a row was obviously a big deal Rangers did that uh, these things when there's not much between sides these things tend to matter a bit more yeah well we're, we're going into we're going into choppy waters now Ger um, <laughs> obviously uh, Sev, because, Sevco is that am I yeah. Well, uh, Celtic, some, some Celtic fans will say the 55 number is, uh, is inaccurate. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, let's not dwell on that. I think more, more, more so it's the, it's the 10 in a row. Uh, that's the kind of the holy grail because Celtic and Rangers have obviously both, both, reached, nine, both reached, reached nine in a row and, not, and none of them have got to 10 in a row. Uh, I'm not saying Posse Cognitive team are going to get to 10 in a row. Absolutely not. Um but um, but look, any any record that one has over the other, they will they will milk it, you know. Um, but in the here and now, uh, I think Celtic fans will be thinking as long as Postecoglou is at the club, that's that Rangers won't get near them. And I think there is there's a there's an element of truth in that because his signings have been so on the money, and it's only. Rangers, Rangers had a, when they won the league, they had an outstanding season, but simultaneously Celtic were imploding, and they were making a ton of bad decisions. Celtic at the moment are a club that are making a ton of good decisions, and until they start making bad ones, I can't see Rangers overtaking them. And is Dermot Desmond likely to open the purse strings, release them a little bit for for Ange, given that there is success and he has at various stages in the past been occasionally. Generous. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, I don't know. I guess I'll just get Dermot on the phone now. He loves he loves talking to journalists. Um, uh, I think. Well, one of the more impressive things, Jar, about about what Pasta Cogley has done is that they sold Hudson Edward and they sold Christopher Iyer, and they got thirty something million, thirty five, thirty six million for the two of them. He's largely rebuilt his entire team uh, on that money. Largely, not exclusively, but largely. So it's not like he's come in and they've given him an extra 30 or 40 million to throw at the team. There's been an awful lot of trading going on. That's what's really impressive. Um, very little money has been wasted by Pasta Cogner in the transfer market. So I, don't, I think Dermot Desmond obviously has been, a, uh, has been a huge part of Celtic for, for many, many years now. But it's not through largesse that they're achieving this. All right, Tom, great to have you with us again. Thanks a million. Cheers, lads. It's uh, Tom English there, BBC Sports, giving us his thoughts on the old firm and uh, the uptick in fortunes of the Scottish rugby team. Saw the, the, 